What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Autotempest.com. Listen, if you're looking for a car, there could be any number of reasons you're looking for a car. Either you actually want to buy a car, maybe you're looking to sell your car and you want to see what it's worth, maybe you just want to see what the market's doing, maybe you got spare time and you're just browsing around. Here's why you should use Autotempest.com because it, it combines all of the other sites into one place. All those annoying different sort of little mid-level uh, cars for sale sites, all those can be combined into one search with Autotempest.com. Even people who don't really have very many things going on doesn't mean you want to do the same thing over and over again. You don't want to retype those search terms into a million different sites. You just go to one place, autotempest.com, and they do it all for you. They look all over the internet and combine all those search results with the best of Facebook Marketplace, the best of Craigslist nationally, and the best of eBay Motors. That's where you're going to find your stuff, guys. Autotempest.com, it saves you time, it saves you money, it brings the whole world of used cars into one web page. Check it out, folks, at autotempest.com. We're also brought to you by Crown and Caliber. Crown and Caliber is the number one place online to buy a secondhand luxury watch. They have the best selection, Rolex, Omega, Breitling, Blanc Pond, Panerai, AP, you name it. They're always rotating through stuff. They're always buying, they're always selling, so you always want to keep checking back that new arrivals tab, see what's going on. I have my eye on something very special right now, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because one of you guys is going to buy it before I can. Uh, I've got two things for you to tell you about Crown and Caliber. One, they are giving away a Rolex Submariner. The Rolex Submariner is pretty much a staple of any major watch collection. If you've got a collection, odds are you either have or want a Rolex Submariner. They're giving one away for free, folks. Crownandcaliber.com slash TST. No purchase necessary. Just go to crownandcaliber.com slash TST fill out the form, you're entered to win a Rolex Submariner. That's thing one. Thing two, you're going to buy a watch from Crown and Caliber. You're going to want this code. Write it down. TST175. Code TST175. That's going to get you $175 off your first watch purchase at crowningcaliber.com. TST175. Oh, there it is. See? Dun, 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 comments, com, com, and then you exist. Yay. What up, everybody? It's the Smoking Tire Podcast, but you knew that because you clicked on it. How you doing? How you doing? It's a good little Tuesday afternoon. Nice little beauty of a delightful Los Angeles day. Dan Edmonds is in studio. Hello, sir. Hello. Thanks Welcome. for having me. Welcome. in. Yeah. Nice to see you. I enjoy your Twitterness. Oh, you. are you. were a thank good you. follow on Twitter. <laughs> I um, try. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you tried. But I don't, you know. Yeah. Uh, there it is. Pull that up. Follow that man on Twitter. Edmonds underscore test. Sideways Miata. We can get off to a good start with the actual size sticker on the Miata. You want to know about Although, that? You, yes, I do. Well, that was uh, something that uh, my crew chief and I did on the way to Road Atlanta for the runoffs when I ran that car. Uh, that's the first... Miata to ever win a race anywhere. That's the first that's, Miata to ever win a race anywhere? That's one of the three cars that was shown in 1989 at the Chicago Auto Show. <laughs> what? Serial number 17. Really? Your, was it your car? Or was it a I, press car or something? It was a press car. Well, no. The red and the blue one went in the press fleet. The uh -huh. white one went to dealer training, presumably because it wasn't as photogenic. Uh-huh. And so I knew somebody who worked at Mazda, and I was racing sport compact cars in the San Diego region at the time with SCCA, and I was, you know, kind of nationally competitive. And at the time, I think I was running a CRX Generation 2. Okay. Uh, before it was cool to drive a CRX with a cage in it around town, <laughs> I was it's driving it. It's only barely cool now. It's barely cool now, yeah. but it, it, when I was it's doing cool it- cool if you're Andy Hollis. Fast and Furious hadn't been invented yeah. yet, so yeah. I was just- a, a weirdo with a, with a <laughs> CRX with a cage in it. So anyway, uh, we um, started talking about this car, and I didn't know what it was because it hadn't been released yet, and this guy was a Mazda insider. And But we put together a team to run it in a precursor to the World Challenge and the Escort Endurance Series. I don't remember who was sponsoring it at the time, but we were going to run it in that series. As and, an as-yet-unknown car? Well, I didn't know what it was yet. Okay. Um, 
when we first started cooking this up. But then when I got the green light to go pick up the car, I had a dually and uh, I had an enclosed fifth wheel trailer that I hauled my race cars around in. So I was the one who went up to um, Benicia at the time where Mazda's training center was and picked up the car. And I saw it for the first time when I walked in the door. Oh, that's what a Miata is. Yeah, so, pre, this pre-public seeing it this ever. Is, uh, no, Chicago had happened. Okay. Um, but I don't know if they were on sale yet. This was late June of 1989. Uh, so the mags hadn't quite cycled yet. Uh, they might have had their <laughs> embargoed stories written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really know the timing. I wasn't in the business at the time. I was working for the Department of Defense back then. <laughs> so wait, how did, then how do you get a, a pre-pro Mazda race Cause I, car? Because I was running because it was a government job i had a lot of time to race on the weekends because we had every other friday off and i was nationally competitive and i knew people you know just because i don't know i just knew this guy named jim jordan who worked at mazda at the time and he knew about this car and knew the pr people and so we got our hands on it and then i brought it to riverside international raceway for the last race at Riverside in July of 1989. I think there were two last races though. They had another one the next year because uh-huh. they got a reprieve and added a little pavement <laughs> oh, yeah. to get got... around the, the uh, Mervins that was taking over turn six. Uh, so anyhow, um, one of those last races at Riverside, I had the thing in my enclosed trailer, but nobody could see it except for certain people who yeah. could go in and look at it, but I was racing my, my Honda. And so anyway, we caged it up and then um, took it to Willow Springs to an SCCA driver's school, which Danny McKeever was the chief instructor at the time. <laughs> Who's and, that? Uh, yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and he, um, you could rent time by just entering the driver's school, even though you weren't getting education. <laughs> okay. And you could test your car that way, as long as you stayed out of the way of the students. That's funny. So we did that. And- with the cage in the car, we were suitably impressed, but yeah. didn't really have anything to go by, and we didn't have a hard top yet. No, we did, but it hadn't been, we hadn't figured out the bolt-on part. Uh-huh. Anyhow, that was late 1989, so the logbook on that car is like August 1989 or something like that, whenever that was. And then 1990 was the year we were supposed to go race it, and the whole deal fell apart. The rules got changed. I don't remember exactly what happened, but it ended up staying in my enclosed trailer <laughs> and so everybody went their separate ways did it stay there to the point of becoming annoying Were you, was it was it get this out of here or was this if i keep my mouth shut eventually this is my car <laughs> well it was i didn't really think about it that yeah. way you know because we didn't really even know if this was a car you wanted to race yet mm-hmm. not really yeah, you, true. did you take it out and drive it a little bit and go oh my god i love this thing like how did you Couldn't feel drive about it on the street could drive it on, yeah. never have yeah. driven it on the street Really? Uh, Not even like winky face? Uh, you no. Know, it's midnight. Well, okay. we unloaded it and drove it down onto the beach at La Jolla once for a photo shoot. Wow. And that was about it. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, that was before we caged it, actually. So um, we, um, so er- anyway, every- anyway, everybody went their separate ways. I ended up with a car. So February 1991 rolls around. The car is now a year old because SECA, SECA showroom stock, the car had to be a year old Oh, that, really? That era. So I couldn't have raced it in showroom stock in 1990. Why? Do you know why that rule existed? I think they wanted to be able to size the vehicles up and uh-huh. see where they would classify them. Uh-huh. And if they if they just went ahead and Let classified them run a some brand track new t- days first and see where the lap times look there like or something. There track days, really, to speak of, like there are now, which is hard to imagine. But, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't know the policy because it didn't make sense to me at the time. So, Wait, so there weren't track days? I mean, no, I, well, I, there were like, you could do the Alpha Club yeah, or, was the, all, or was the Shelby all club, club. related. You could yeah, do a yeah. couple of those, but not too many. There was no Button Willow yet, I don't mm. think. When did they build that place? Uh, I paid extra surpluses on my uh, entry fees for years, you know, as we all did, <laughs> but I, you know, never raced there because, really? yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. So that's a whole nother deal. But <laughs> so, so this car, uh, I brought it to Willow Springs for the first national of the year um, and just slaughtered everybody. Took two or three seconds off the lap record. Just went so much faster than I thought. What uh, cars were you racing against at the time in that class? Uh, there were MR2s mm-hmm. and- That uh, first gen MR2s, yeah, right? Yeah. And Not they were considered ones. really fast. 
Yeah, the, 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 the first ones. Yeah, this is showroom stock C. Okay. So it's a 1.6 liter car with an open diff, and uh, you know had to have the hard top on it, but mm-hmm. they allowed you to remove the soft top so you could put a proper cage in there because the the soft top's kind of in the way. Yeah. But they figured that the hard top would make up for the weight difference. Uh, they normally didn't allow any any stripping of anything on a showroom stock car. The carpet's in there, the seat belts are in there, all that stuff. You have to use factory alignment. You got to use uh, you got to use Mazda air filters and Mazda oil filters. You can't go off brand. The only thing you could do is put tires on it, and uh, the tires had to be DOT approved. But they're like eighty tread, <laughs> yeah. and then you shave them, and they go almost yeah. slick. <laughs> wow. So the tires are for are killer. So anyway, we brought this car out. I brought this car out there, um, and it was fast. And nobody else had run one yet. All the guys on the East Coast in Florida, Randy Popst and some others, they were running whatever they had run the last year. So, uh, you know, a FX-16, I think one guy ran, and FX- Honda Civic yeah, yeah, SI. Yeah. And, and, but I had the first Miata win and track records, and immediately there was just like, a Everyone's, whole bunch of people just jumped on the car. Yeah, yeah. And they Everyone also needs argued, a Miata now. And they also argued it should be in showroom stock B, and there was a whole back and forth. But yeah, I went on to just win a bunch of races with that car the first year. And then that the the car, the picture in the dirt, the rally cross period, that was after I'd stopped racing it, and it sat in my garage in Arizona. By then, I'd taken a job with Toyota, and I was working at the Proving Grounds, and I was living in a little town called Wickenburg, and that thing was just, you know, had black widows crawling yeah. through it in my garage while i didn't race it and then in 1999 my wife and i are coming back from prescott arizona where we'd had dinner and we were driving down the hill and we're following this beat up volvo that's going like 35 and a 35 and this is a really fun road nobody does that but this is like some weird beat, beat up volvo but it's got stickers on it and these really oversized mud flaps and we couldn't figure it out and then i go around a corner and there's a guy with a radar gun but he's not a cop and there's like an seca banner and I'm like, oh this is a prescott forest rally and we're on transit stage and so we followed the guy into the service park and i got my hands on a rule book and they were going to have rally cross the next year so i took that thing as is with an open diff and the cage and just showroom stock suspension on it uh, and just put some rally tires on it that I got from one of the guys I met, and I won the Rally Cross Championship <laughs> with it that year. Yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. Best was that Rally Cross pretty ever. much just like flat, uh, flat, you know, dirt with uh, with cone course? Kind yeah, of thing? it's kind of like an autocross, but with a lot fewer yeah. cones, and every run counts. At least I don't know if they still do it that way now, because back then Rally Cross was just getting started. We did some Rally Cross in like what Ridgecrest is that? Is that where it was? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this it was, was really. Fun. It was. I mean, it was yeah. super, super good time. Honestly, much more fun than regular autocross. Oh yeah, it was. Mu- it was like a kind of like a giant slalom course. Yeah. There'd be pairs of gates pretty far apart. And yeah, kind of choose your own adventure between the cones, as long as you, you went through them. Oh, interesting. And then you know you just get all your times added together. And that would be your score. But and it was all dirt, right? Because nowadays some rally crosses half tarmac, half dirt. So just want to clarify. That's like the European style rally cross. Yeah, this is West Coast rally cross. So it was more SECA autocross on dirt. Yeah. You know, not like the race head to head type of autocross. So Which it, is a phenomenal motorsport, by yeah, the way. Yeah, rally it, cross has kind of got two or three different you it know, does. definitions depending yeah. on where you watch it. Well, this preceded the rap wars of East Coast. West <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, yeah, so uh, some of the races were at, uh, well, one was at Holtville, which is a racetrack I had raced on on the pavement, but on the rally cross, we were in the dirt <laughs> next like in to the, it. In, the, in where, like, the trailers normally get yeah, parked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then another one was in Boulder City at a, on a dry lake bed. Oh, yeah. Just a huge dry lake bed. And actually, there- That's yeah, good speeds going, big drifts are hanging out. Oh, that's, that's where that Well, that's where that picture from. came from, the one on the far right there. I was going to ask if it was El Mirage originally. It's got a very that's El Boulder Mirage-y City. vibe. Yeah. yeah. But, but the thing is, is there were, like- 55 entries, and I was the overall leader at lunch. Overall. And there's four-wheel drive Subarus and Evos and all that I mean, that make, I guess that makes you a pretty good driver, huh? Or they hadn't figured out Rallycross yet, and they still had their <laughs> stiff, springy suspension oh, for landing big jumps, and I didn't. Oh, was this the, this was the Whoa. first, I think it was year, the first of year of Rallycross? I, yeah, the California Rally Series is like this sub-club yeah, on the West yeah. Coast that kind of cherry picks some SCCA sanctioned races, and some, I don't know if they still do it, but... Uh, 
I, our friend races it races re, uh, re, stage rally with it in yeah California well races. this was so this was you know they were the ones that were doing this prescott rally although seca sanctioned that as a pro rally uh but it was also a local points rally and that's why i learned about this but it was going to be their inaugural year and uh so well everybody the, just brought yeah. their rally cars to it <laughs> If you beat a bunch of rally cars, that would that's impressive. Wow. But it was Miata. like smooth, you know. Oh, th- their man. their stiff suspension didn't do them any favors. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, this is totally. Stock. You still have this car? No, I restored it about five years ago, and for about the twentieth anniversary of the Miata, so more than five years ago. Yeah. And then I offered it to Mazda because it was kind of in my way, and I thought maybe they could do something with it. They weren't interested. Then about three years after that, I got a call from them because the ND was about to come out, right? And they wanted to kind of uh, re, you know, recap twenty five years of Mazda history, and so they asked if I still would give it back to them. Mm-hmm. So I did, and then it went to the Chicago Auto Show, and it went to the SEMA Show, and it went to all these different things. It's now in their basement collection. Cool. You say give it back to them? Well. <laughs> it kind of started that way, so I figured I guess it should they, end that way. Did they give it to you? Did you ever actually buy? Oh, did was, you? Is, you know, there's these dollar cars. There's dollar you hear car. About? Yeah, 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 one of those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we we uh, we we are okay with dollar cars. Dollar cars are good. Usually they're crushers, and they end up getting you yeah. know destroyed. And uh, this one didn't. They become SEMA cars first now. Yeah. Now they go to all the tuners, and then they become SEMA cars, and then they like kind of just the manufacturers sort of forget them about later. them. Yeah, yeah. yeah Miatas yeah. are great. I have a an RF right now. Yeah. It's so good. It's just so good. It fits you so well. The ergonomics yeah. are perfect. The shifting's great. Oh. Uh, they did a really good job with the steering. Like at super low speeds, Absolutely. it's incredibly easy. Yeah. But then it it really like tightens up, and it's super accurate. Like. Everything about it is is awesome, unless you need to carry stuff. But otherwise, <laughs> or have like a Bluetooth conversation on yeah. the highway. I was able to do that, and uh, I think it was louder for me than it was for the person I was talking to. Like they could hear me, but I felt like I had to project. Yeah. So, but because it's noisy. Yeah. They're fun. The new motor, ooh, the updated ooh. motor, is very nice, excellent. Well, I got to drive a 30th anniversary, which is the orange mm-hmm. one, and it's probably got another name other than orange. But uh, I think I dr- it's just 30th anniversary, isn't it? Just yeah, anniversary. I mean, the, the oh, num- the color. The color, yeah. The yeah color. I don't know what the color's called, yeah. but it was orange. And uh, I got to drive that up to Laguna Seca, and we can call it that now since Boss is not, uh, not sponsored. We don't have anymore. to respect there's the no WeatherTech. Sw- there's no swear <laughs> jar like there used to be. <laughs> there's no, we don't, isn't it WeatherTech Laguna Seca? Yeah, but I don't think they're as, as worried about it as Mazda was when I it was Mazda. Well, I don't away. think, I'm not worried about getting press floor mats, so I don't need to worry exactly. about offending them. <laughs> Well, yeah, so... That's the, a great color, that orange. It that is. looks good. Yeah, it looks really good. Yeah. And so we had that to drive up to the 30th anniversary um, uh, Miata reunion at Laguna Seca, and the guy who put that together, a guy named Rick Weldon, um, he um, talked Mazda into letting the, them display my car and, and the original Chicago car. So my car was there nice i got to drive it oh really which was the first time i'd driven it in years i got to bring my wife along and she held a a, a checkered flag out nice. we did a kind of a mock victory lap with 300 cars behind us it was amazing didn't uh didn't sam smith go and drive like 25 miatas yeah. in a day during yeah, that it's a thing really, it's a good article it's a good it was, story yeah, it was like 20 yeah, or something a lot of miatas out yeah there. That I, I drove uh, the flying Miata ND, yeah, that sort of chalky colored mm-hmm. one that had the Psycho LS3 in it, and all exactly. The, did you ever drive that thing? Nope, the best. I bet. I mean, you'd think someone, you go there, oh, how do you even drive that? It must be completely ridiculous and undrivable. Like, no, it's totally mellow and yeah. awesome, and all you have to do is like use a little less throttle. It's like an LS exactly. motor, like, you're not yep. gonna like. The, all the power doesn't just come out of nowhere. You have to ask for it first. You right. know, it's it's that's the beauty of naturally aspirated engines. Oh yeah, absolutely. You and, know, and that car, you know, even when you don't do that to the motor, it's just so well balanced. I mean, the reason I was able to take three seconds off the lap record at Willow and at Laguna Seca is because it's a momentum car. You can yeah. just carry all kinds of speed through the corners and just embarrass the guys in the Camaros that were in the same race in showroom stock GT, but they had all the horsepower. They'd leave me on the corner and then be in my way. And I mean, leave me on the straightaway and be in my way on the corners. Yeah. But it's amazing it's that, that that car, as small as it is, can is great with stock power. It's great with a little bit of warming. It's great with an LS. Like it, 
even though it's as short as it is, you know, when people like the Fly Miata guys, when they build one, they don't really extend the wheelbase to 102 no. inches like an E46 or like some, you know, that kind of good number of an M2. They keep it short and it still just yeah. does such a good job handling that power, putting it down yep. and making you feel really comfortable with it. Like it doesn't really make sense. It's amazing. I know. And then, I mean, they didn't design it to slide around on dirt, but I felt like Steve Kinzer out there. Well, it's, Steve Kinzer's it, I mean, a sprint car racer. <laughs> we've, learned, uh, <laughs> we've learned with the Safari 911s that like cars with good uh, dynamics on the road yeah. easily translate to off-road or, or light off-road in use anyway. Rally. Balance is balance. Yeah. You Weight know, distribution and, and, and stuff and like that. good suspension is good suspension. And, you know, I didn't have any mods on my car at all when I raced it, except tires. That's Whatever awesome. it was, it was just tires. <clears throat> Our friend Mike Musto, do you know him from up north? Um, no, He's I He's like a muscle I, car kind of guy. Uh -huh. He's fucking big, great big goofball. We love him. And uh, he, had a, he built a, a track day Mustang to run at like Sonoma and Laguna. He lives up north. So it was like a 2013 or 14 Mustang GT with just like shocks like the, mm -hmm. the the suspension right good wheels and tires and a roll bar mm -hmm. totally stock not yep. even an ecu to nothing else and he hammered the shit out of it for like four years and if it had an issue he took, drove it to the dealer right you know warranty whatever and he ran very very strong numbers in it there it is look at oh, that yeah nice uh, i think he got to what did he get down to 43s 42s maybe i mean he got he got to the in the low 40s with it he was running uh -huh. good was yeah fast. eventually it was square stands cortex racing did the suspension work cortex, in it. It had like a that's four, who did it yeah uh like a half cage and stuff but you know he wanted it to be reliable so he didn't touch the powertrain and it right. did a really good job and then he sold it to somebody and they still run it as a track car like one yeah, of the most yeah. fun cars we've ever driven on the track was a Mustang just like that with the full maximum motorsports suspension yep. and nothing else. Right. And it was so balanced and great and just just hammering, 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 hammering. Good yeah, at everything. Four years ago, we had a Mustang GT in the long-term test fleet where I used to work, and it had the track pack on it. And I took it to Big Willow and gave people rides. Uh, and uh, you know it was a it was a charity fundraiser mm. for type one diabetes, and uh, I was uh, there just to give people rides, and I was chasing down all these Porsches and having such a great time. <laughs> that car is so well balanced, yeah. right off the showroom floor. Yeah, yeah, the, they've they're, done they're such they're a really good job good. with it. Um, wait, I just want to. Oh, but okay, since you're a fan of suspension travel, as I can see. <laughs> um, do you think all the new stuff is just too fucking stiff? What's that? All the new, like all the new sport cars, like f especially the front engine stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, a little, a little mechanical, simp you know, you can go too stiff too easily, and I, I, you know, the the real world has has uneven surfaces, and even when you're on a track, you know, I like to eat curbs a little bit. Yeah. And you don't want your suspension to be too rock hard. I mean, if it's a pure racing situation, that's one thing. But if you're on the street and you've got to deal with reality on reality's terms, a little compliance is nice. Like and this morning I drove, my friend Paul has an E39 M5 mm -hmm. with 27,000 miles on it. I uh, heard, It yeah. is fresh. And I spent all morning in it. He yeah. just said, gave me the keys and said, go have fun. And you get in it. First off, you get in it and you can see all of the grain in the leather like oh, wow. think about a bmw m5 like the last one you've been in like the e39 or like your m3 the leather is nice but it's like it's sh kind of shiny because it's been fucking driven on the steering wheel you could see the grains of oh the leather. it wasn't the, all shined out on the and steering over. wheel wow. wow it was that new that's a light it's like touch. fully restored or what no no, no. Yeah. original wow yeah from fuck it's from eag too so it's a you know <laughs> yeah, huge yeah. dollar car and I'm driving it up, up Ensenal Canyon at a very nice clip. Mm -hmm. And it's really got some good give to it through these. And it's like not bouncy or stiff right. or like it's really just kind of sucking everything up. I'm like, oh, my God, this is so great. Yeah. And I you know, wish all cars could ride just like this. Well, I raced showroom stock cars, which by definition have unmodified suspension yeah. so there's a lot of body roll and you put some good tires on a car you can you can you know really up the pace you can accentuate the body roll quite a lot well, yeah. good, what i mean tires, is yeah. you don't need to be afraid of body, body roll and just try to kill it i mean yeah. obviously if you're in a competition situation you do what you got to do body roll is not necessarily the enemy no 
It, it is. can be kind of good, actually, yeah. in and, some cases. And one of the things that's nice about the Miata is you, you feel it working. That's, you yeah. Know, it's accessible at uh, street speeds. You don't, you know, it's not like it's got way too much tire and way too much suspension, and you have to drive it so fast to actually feel it working that you're now in jail. Right. So, I mean, that's what's neat about the Miata is its performance is, like, really achievable, and you can really, you can really you know tap into it well it's you know i feel like really when you start to learn how to really go fast is when you start to learn about front rear and left white rate mm-hmm. like weight mm-hmm. transfer and like how to make that work for you yeah and like miatas do that like really well they have they have a little extra travel yeah. so like you hit the brake and you can like feel that dive and you can feel when the wheel loads up and whatever it's just it, you know it you can just feel that it's responding to what yeah. you do and that's what makes it fun and there's a real big gray area in between grip and slip right. as well which is fun to play in but it, you know it happens at 40 it doesn't happen <laughs> it doesn't happen at 140 right you know yeah. in mclarens um <laughs> do you think that that journalists had a hand in making all the cars get stiffer and stiffer of like if there was a comparison and car A had like race derived suspension, let's say it's you know the more sporty model they have, and then cars B and C and D were just like a li- like two years behind. Do you think someone would get out of car A and go, wow, that really cor- that really reacted to my steering input really well? And then the other ones, like you'll see the term, this car had a little more roll than I'd like. Like you'll see that. Yeah. And do you think it was engineered out to kind of squash those things? And now we've kind of painted ourselves in a corner. I don't know exactly because you know for a while I wasn't working in journalism. I was I was the engineer working on tuning the suspension of the vehicle, and that never affected me. But of course I was working on trucks most of the time. But uh, certainly in the marketing, you know, 20s and, you know, big wheels and, yeah. and, and, and all these things are really easy to, to, uh, to market to people, yeah. you know, that well, this we're is fighting lower, weight and rims, right? big white rims. <laughs> yeah. And, well, yeah, big rims and wide tires are really heavy. And now yeah. you've got a lot of unsprung mass to deal with. And, and maybe that's not the best thing in every case. Or, or in most cases, yeah. I would say. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think I like there's rims, but you know, there's a little bit of people like big rims, and the marketing people are easy. You know, we're willing to push that. Or is it that we need big rims because we need big brakes because we got fat cars now? <laughs> it's kind of I mean, uh, the waterfall. You can you know how far uphill do we want to piss here? Yeah, we can, we can go all the way. <laughs> right. But I yeah I think uh, you know on a lot of cars that I that I. Uh, that I drive, you know, the big wheel tire option isn't necessarily the one I like to drive the most. I, oh, I agree with you. In yeah. most cases, yeah, yeah you usually you don't actually want to get the big rim. Zach's uh, M3, if you saw outside, has got the 18s on it, on mm-hmm. the E46, which yeah. is the right move. Yeah, I think that's kind of like my upper limit in most cases. Yeah, I mean, I guess unless you're on in certain types of, like, crossovers or something, you could probably go a little bigger. I don't know. I, if I'm going to do a crossover or an off-road vehicle, I want some sidewall. I, I, want, I agree I, with I, you in general. I do. You know, I've got a, a Jeep downstairs, and it's got 17s, and it would be ridiculous if it had anything bigger than that. I mean, I just went to Mammoth this past weekend in a in a Porsche Macan, you know, which has 20s and Macan S, and it was pretty fucking nice. It was pretty yeah. nice. Had the snow tires on there. You're not the taking ride. that off-road, so what the No, heck? we're not taking it off No. Yeah. Macan's a nice car. Macan's a nice there car. We Macan actually... S- that's, we that's attempt- a good all-rounder. <laughs> and this one actually has the Cobb tune and a, a cat-back exhaust on it, which pretty much makes it a GTS, like, for all intents and right. purposes. Um, and it's it's very nice. But um, we tried to take it off-road. I got a Velar, a Range Rover Velar uh-huh. press car. I was like, I'm taking this motherfucker. And it had the small wheels. Right. They're like, they sent me this Velar. And I was like, 18s. Cool. Let's hit the trail. <laughs> and so we brought the Macan, and it was like, my friend was like, ah, if a Velar can do it, my Macan can do it. No. The <laughs> Macan made it. We went to, uh, you, you know, the Rauer Flats? Yeah. We went to Rauer Flats, the uh, the Pioneer Trail, the, the, the biggest trail they got there, pretty much. Mm-hmm. The Macan made it about 100 yards. <laughs> 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 Had to do a fair amount of reversing <laughs> to get out and bail. <laughs> Velar made it. Velar is a real nice. Range Rover. Shockingly, yeah. it is. Yeah, it is. All right. Um, uh, tell me about your name. What about it? It's my name. It's your name. Yeah. But is it the Edmunds.com name? No. Isn't that fucked up? <laughs> it's weird, uh, but, you know, it's a first name for them, Edmund apostrophe S, 
first name, possessive. And so when you make a website, they confiscate your apostrophes mm-hmm. and it became Edmonds. So it's really mm-hmm. my name. It's not really theirs. Gotcha. If you look at it it's one a, way. It's someone named Edmund. Yeah. So it could Man, be anybody. It could Fuck. be anybody's you relative. You had it first. That's bullshit. Well, yeah. <laughs> but you do have a but you do have a car background. You were you were a bit born into cars. Yeah. Your, dad, your your dad was a proper a proper racing driver. Yeah, yeah? he uh, he he raced in the Indy 500 in a Roadster, front engine Roadster in 1957. That's crazy. Rook, rookie of the year. So he's really? on the same trophy as some other uh, notary notables. How many notaries? Uh, I guess some notaries might have raced the How many se- did he race seasons? Was it seasons then or did you just race the Indy 500? You know, he a lot Don of people Edmonds were, was your Don dad, right? Edmonds, yeah. right. A lot of people were just trying to run the show at yeah. 500. You know, they'd run sprints or midgets or whatever throughout the year. Uh, there, there, you know, the whole championship was, I think, not as well defined. But I don't know. I'm starting to make stuff up here. <laughs> but certainly uh, later on, you know, in the 70s, you know, like when Joe Leonard was running uh, at the California 500 at the racetrack in Ontario that got torn down so they could make one in Fontana instead. Um, he he used to have to race a championship where you'd run a dirt car, a front engine car on dirt one mile ovals, and then run the, run the pavement car on like Indy. And, yeah. and so it was a championship that was based on dirt and and pavement. That's extremely cool. I like yeah, that multidisciplinary yeah. so thing. So it was, it was, uh, is that him right there? That's him right there. Oh, looking good. Yeah, that's him. That in car is awesome. Yeah. Talk about what sidewall. Type of, what type of car is that? Oh boy. You're going to ask me something that embarrasses Do me. Do we know? Can it, does it say uh, on it somewhere? <laughs> well, it says SPL and McKay. Yeah. A lot of them were one offs, but I don't know who made that one. Oh, but uh, it was fr- front, front engine car. Yeah. Yeah. Offenhauser. Look at the sidewall. It was often like Offenhauser power. Yeah. That's awesome. So, do you know the whereabouts of that thing? Uh, it's been restored. I'm not sure where it is at the moment, um, oh, but off it's a out private there. collection yeah, somewhere. It's somewhere. How and, cool! And so I grew up with that, and uh, so I go to the. He had a race shop. By the time I came around, he had retired from driving. He worked for Bill Strop for a while. He worked for Bill Thomas for a while, and Bill of Thomas the Cheetah fame. The Cheetah. My dad yeah. designed the Cheetah. Fuck out of here! Yeah, that's th- awesome. Bill like Thomas the, was like, the financier. Like drew it, engineered yeah, it. Yeah, like what drew way the chalk drew? on the ground and, and yeah. Because that's like, got, this is one of the funkiest looking cars ever made. I mean, the the, the, the Cheetah is a, is a properly yeah. styled car. You could look at it and say, you know, the first Viper might have been oh, inspired yeah. by that. You Cheetahs know? are funky as hell. Have you ever driven one? I haven't driven one, but I've I helped restore one when I was in high school. Which I, God, I'd love to have a go in one the of those. The reason they look the way they look is because there's no drive shaft. The tail of the transmission just connects right to the to rear the end. Oh my God. There's, there's one U joint. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's so, so awesome. It's like how far wow. back can we get the motor? Yeah, look at that from above. The, wow. the above three quarter really does it. That you're, motor you're, is way back there. The, the pedal radiator box, is behind the front axle. Jeez. The pedal box is underneath a couple of the header tubes. <laughs> no way. That's, cr- that's creative. It's, I think I saw one at Pebble Beach once, yeah, and they I, show I up stuck there once my in a head while. in there, and I was like, nah, that shit ain't happening. So that really jump-started his career. And, you know, he that in Indy, uh, he actually got a commission to build an Indy car, and so he told Bill Thomas that he was going to have to leave and take all his tools, which happened to be the tools that were in Thomas's shop, <laughs> and go do his own thing. But they, Bill basically allowed him to build the Indy car in that in shop, the shop so the tools could stay Please there. Please stay. I need, <laughs> this I need your torque wrench. He built the so first cool. prototype that was aluminum. And then uh, there were fiberglass they ones after that. They ended up being that. fiberglass, Fiberglass right? yeah. after How that. How many do they make? Like 10? There's like it wasn't 12 a lot. or yeah. 13. There's, there's not a lot. This one we're looking at, the color is spectacular. Yeah. It's like gray, gray, green kind of thing. Yeah. that's uh, When I was a kid, I was very um, enamored with that car. My dad never wanted to talk about it because it, the whole <laughs> thing didn't go down well with him. But in the last five or 10 years, he's kind of made his peace with it. Now he's you know, now he likes talking about it yeah. again. But there was a period where he just didn't want to talk. I mean, about it. For people listening, it's like you take a third gen Corvette and you just cut the trunk off, <laughs> yeah. and then you sat yeah. on the axle. I mean, it's so short in the back. The idea was this was supposed to go up against the Cobra. Yeah, and that makes uh, sense. it is 
Camaro, I mean, sorry, Corvette based. Did any of them ever race? Uh, they did, but the problem was uh, Shelby, I, I, I don't know the history because I wasn't right there, but basically around the time that this was being prepped to run against the Cobra, Shelby got the FIA to raise the homologation number. Mm. And that basically made it so that this car so you couldn't compete. So 500 instead yeah, of 50 Yeah, they couldn't build nearly enough yeah. to, 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 to meet the homologation requirements that year. So I had to race in the unlimited class against chaparral and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it won a couple of races, in, you know, at some uh, SECA events, but... It never reached its full potential. I bet if you could fit in this thing, it'd be a riot to drive. I it's got to weigh 2,000 pounds, right? It's like weigh 400 horsepower. At all. <laughs> yeah. I can fit. Give me a call. Yeah, right. Holy hell. Wow. So they oh, built this beast. indie car in Bill Thomas's shop. Yeah, he built that. And then he went off and eventually opened his own shop in Anaheim. And that's when I started hanging out and, you know, cleaning the bathrooms and sweeping what up What did he shit. do at his shop? Midgets and sprint cars. Oh, he cool. was a big, you know, because that's how he got into Indy is midgets and sprint cars. That's the kind of cars that he, you know, really was uh, accomplished at driving and and wanted to build. Well, in L.A. had such a scene of that. Oh, I mean, yeah. it was like we had a Jacob Agajanian on the show like a right. week ago, and you know his you know his grandfather and whatever was like Mister Indy from California, and and uh, so we were talking about the, all the racetracks around L.A. Like there yeah. was like what fifty sixty oh, a lot race tracks around there's a super boring documentary <laughs> but do you remember that documentary i forget what it was like where they raced it's think? where yes yeah, yeah. great memory wow. dude do you remember that you see that one i haven't seen it no it's like it's not done great but if you want to nerd out on yeah. la history it's extremely nerdy and and interesting in that way like i fucking i'm so nerded out on the Santa Monica Grand Prix. Yeah. Do you remember that? I don't remember it. So, but I, well, yeah, I've right. Heard of it. But so the Santa Monica, look at this guy just mobbing his like Miller around the neighborhood. There you go. This is crazy. Best of the year from the Motor Press Guild. Mm hmm. So, but, but they, uh, there was an eight mile circuit that went all the way around Santa Monica and Beverly Hills. Yeah. And they had the, the death curve over the cliff uh, where, where San Vicente became uh -huh. ocean where no one actually ever died. <laughs> um, but yeah. You, my dad basically did oval track stuff and, you know, sprints and midgets. And that's what he sold. And, you know, his company was called Don Edmonds Auto Research, which is interesting because Edmonds, the company I just is work for, does research. auto research. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that the names are that similar on another level. Um, but he, um, yeah, if you wanted to win the Midget National Championship uh, or do well in sprint cars, uh, you had an auto research chassis. And Agajanian's you know, grandpa ran a few of those. Yeah, yeah. They had... Uh, King, oh, they King, ran your chassis? They ran our chassis. The oh, King cool. Alon, I think, was the, the, the there was an association with a guy named Leonard Foss. I'm I, I'm 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 very hazy on this because I was probably ten when all yeah. this was going on. Have you driven a sprint car? Or any never, of that stuff? Never there's a, did. There's a school up in Ventura, I think. Yeah, Seems and like Walter Pankratz is is I think one of the instructors, and he used to work for my dad. Who's that? A guy named Wally Pankratz. Oh no, okay, yeah. really? We'll have, to, we'll have to dig that guy. They're out. crazy. They're like single speed direct drive, and you're sitting on you know the drive like yeah. the transmission. There is no transmission. Uh, it's an in oh, and yeah, out it's right. it's just, Yeah, and it's just you put it in gear, and then a truck pushes you, and then the wheels start the engine. Yeah, and the gas yeah. pedal has like a cup over your toe, so yep. if you get bounced, you don't lose contact with the gas pedal. Yeah, and you can lift it up yeah. with your toe if you need to. If it gets stuck or something, <laughs> yeah, something like they're, that. They're they're crazy. No, they're 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 uh, they're, they're seven hundred the horsepower. Deal. Like yeah. they are. It's not three hundred horsepower on loose surface. It's very very yeah. serious power, yeah. and yeah. they're short. And the tire. I mean, the whole setup looks insane. So yeah, I I didn't really grow up wanting to do that, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why. You know, if I if I shown any interest in it, I probably would have been able to because yeah. my dad knew everybody. And, you know, when I was a kid, uh, the Turkey Night Grand Prix at Ascot was always a big deal. And all his East Coast customers would come to race in the race. So, you know, I shot pool with these guys, Lee Koonsman and, you know, Bettenhausen and all these guys that would come to race this race. And, uh, but I, I, I just... It just didn't interest you? My, my, I, my dad didn't want me to race those cars. And, <laughs> and, Listen, uh, these things are fucking dangerous. Yeah. Well... <laughs> 
he might not have said exactly those yeah, words, yeah. but uh, certainly, um, yeah. So I didn't really get into racing from that. Uh, but later, when I was in high school and college, they started to build something called the Lightning Indy Car, which was designed by Roman Slobodinsky, which ends with a J, so you won't be able to spell That's it. That's a great name. Yeah. So he designed the Lightning, and my dad's company built about 10 of them. Uh, for a guy named Lindsey Hopkins. And one of them was on the front row of Indy in 70-something, oh, 78. Wow. And uh, then he started building um, Super Vs, which are smaller. What's a Super V? It's like a Formula Atlantic car, uh -huh. but it has a Volkswagen four-cylinder engine from oh. a Rabbit Scirocco oh, in it. Oh, interesting. And the idea was... Oh, like those? Yeah, it yeah. looks like a little yeah, Formula Yeah, so the, auto, yeah, yeah, okay. the auto research... Uh, one was pretty quick but they didn't really succeed because the next year they changed the ground effects and suddenly the car was obsolete and you know, it was a whole thing but it was a really neat car it was fun to work on and i did a lot of the riveting and built wings and did a lot of you know that's when i really started to work there and then i went off and got a college degree and moved to san diego and that's a cool history, yeah. though. I mean, that's to grow up around that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, but but I mean, you must have gotten something out of it. I mean, you got you oh, you yeah. just set the track record in a class at a Miata. You know, I mean, like <laughs> that comes from somewhere. I, well, I I guess I just mean just practice, just enjoyment. No, and practice. I, I mean when I went down to San Diego, a buddy of mine at work was running a rabbit. And it had Rabbit Bilstein Cup suspension. And there was a thing, you know, one make race series for rabbits called the Rabbit Bilstein Cup. And he had a car that he had prepped for that, but he only ran the West Coast races. It was a national touring mm. series. That, I vaguely remember seeing some videos on YouTube of like yeah. really good racing, actually. So I, so I went to Riverside with him to just crew for him at one of these races. And then I kind of just was introduced to the whole idea of an SCCA regional national kind of amateur race weekend and all the classes that were there and all the different types of cars and so i went with him a couple of times but i also saw the people working on the corners that were flagging and i signed up to do that and so for three or four years i flagged races and i that got me to IndyCar. you know the Front long row beach, seat <laughs> long beach grand prix you know, yeah. you're, you're showing blue flags to mario andretti and yeah, stuff you yeah. know i mean it's it's a cheap fun free way to get into racing on a really deep level yeah and then i found out that you know now i'm watching all these people race i'm learning how to pass somebody while i'm standing on the side of the road because i'm paying more attention than i would in the stands mm -hmm. i mean i'm i have to because i gotta like decide <laughs> kind of I, a gig <laughs> is this yeah is this guy gonna crash is he gonna make this pass did is you ever have a moment where you like so, something happened and you were like oh god uh, that was because i did my flag job wrong not that no, no, no okay. not that. But I had. That's the one thing that really scares me about a flagger thing is like having a fuck up, and then you know someone gets hurt because of that. Like, yeah, that would bug it, me out. You know they don't pay that much attention to the flag, so <laughs> you don't have to worry about it too much. It's, Touché, it's, advi sir. it's advisory. <laughs> I mean, at, from the driver's side, it's like you see a yellow and you're waving it down, yeah. and, and you're supposed to slow down. And what you do is you don't slow down, but you put your hand out the window and you wave to make it seem like you're slowing down, but you don't actually slow down. That works. A well, there was, there was a little... I planned to slow down. <laughs> yeah. I see Eventually. you. Noted. Now you're going through the, the accident scene with one hand on the wheel. So <laughs> that's not what they want, but uh, it kind of, it can work. <laughs> but uh, so actually, you know, that was a great way to do it. And I eventually saw, you know, all the different classes and I figured out what I could afford and I started racing. Stock. Stock. Yeah. Showroom People stock ask us a lot about like what is the best track car? A fucking stock one with maybe some tires. Yeah, they they, they uh, tires are everything though. Yeah. You know, whenever there's a tire war in NASCAR, or whatever times plummet, you know, it, and then they end up trying to cut costs. So there's a spec tire, and then times kind of stagnate for a while. Yeah. But you could gain a lot of time or you know performance out of any you know with just with a tire change yeah did you shave your own tires i did so what's the i you know you hear i hear people talking about shave tires i saw someone do it once what are you are you literally what tool are you using well what are you doing when you're shaving tires if you're doing it right, somebody has a machine oh, and they do right. it for you on a tire <laughs> lathe which oh. is made for the process okay but if you're a cheap guy like i was and you didn't have access to somebody who did that you get a Bondo file, and you jack up the front. Don't do this at home, kids. 
<laughs> but what I would do with my, uh, I had a rabbit because. I decided to go race against my own buddy, so I got another rabbit and basically set this my car fun. up like his. I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> oh, that's so, the machine you're supposed to have. Yeah. Right so there. what okay. I what I did at, in the pits at Riverside is jack up the car on one side, put it on a nice solid jack stand because you got to be safe. Then start the car, put it in gear, and because it has an open <laughs> differential, the tire in the air just spins, and then you just get over there with your bondo file and hold it down oh so that God. so that if it, so you can be re- ready to let go in case it like kicks it back or something it, holy shit yeah. that sounds and very dangerous, dangerous. <laughs> it, it wasn't good don't do I it i think zach didn't the guys in new zealand have some kind of there's knife better ways. that got hot it was like a shaver that's, thing. That's grooving your tires. Like oh, you would see guys, you would see guys at midget races and sprint car races as the conditions change, decide to add more tread blocks oh. by just taking a groover and cutting. Oh, that's what they were doing. They were making tread blocks with that fucking thing. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. The, so the conditions have changed, and now this this tire doesn't have enough tread blocks. So let's add a few. Yeah, and that would be one of the tuning things you might do. Uh, but no, what I was trying to do was get the full tread depth cut down because less tread means better adhesion, uh, more heat dissipation because you don't have a squirmy block. You have yeah. more of a solid surface. It's more like a slick. But of course, your tire life goes down. But in yeah, a but way- you're racing. You're, it's SCCA race. Well, it's it, not an endurance race. Well, and, and a full tread tire, because it squirms, actually can- crumble and have its own problems so True. so actually there's a sweet spot where you shave off some tread and it actually makes the tire last longer in a given race oh how interesting but wow. this is all old technology now i'm sure since dan's old timey bondo file shaving technique uh-huh. has been uh passed by there's a better i don't know where's that here? article from car and driver from how, how old is that are article they, they it's called it? like the lost art of tire shaving but it's from it's, fr- it's oh, from 2010. 2010 oh yeah but there's so not a bondo file that's a lost, machine yeah the article's yeah. lost at this point no i think you can even buy shaved tires from tire rack oh really i think so that'd be I gangster thought, if they do I them there thought, but I, I could be wrong that would be shaving at tire rack yeah i think you can pre tire buy, shaving is available you can buy them free shaved Oh, so, so they oh, so they so they sell the car tires that SCCA racers might want to use, and they can sell and then them. And they to shave them, but they also that second one is a good tip. If you get a flat tire, rather than replacing all four on an all-wheel drive vehicle, you can get a shaved tire, so it matches. That's that's the commercial reason. I mean, for I, doing it. It is a commercial reason for doing it. Yes. <laughs> oh, is that you think it's just like no, who no, the fuck I, is gonna get get a shaved no. tire on their Forester, but like. <laughs> I'm gonna shave my Forester. That's, tire. I'm. That's a, a good thing to know, though, that you can get that from a uh, tire. Yeah. I mean, again, I haven't done it, but I've seen it. I mean, we should get a set, Zach. You think we should do a shaved tire comparison? I think we definitely should. Yeah, shaved tire tire tests are nerdy. Nobody really cares, but I care. I've done some tire Two tests, and they are. were a lot of work. There were <laughs> not a lot of readers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We did one that was really good. It was it was a comparison of all season tires to snow tires to summer tires. Uh huh. And we in the snow, and in the wet, and on the dry. And it was it took nine months to do this test because oh. the first thing we had to do was ship all the tires to Baudet, Minnesota, in February and do the snow part, and then ship them home and then take them to i think a ford proving grounds in surprise arizona where they where i think uh, volvo still had control of it mm-hmm. so we could get on there and we rented it and did the wet and then we took them to the california speedway where edmonds and inside line did their their uh regular testing and did the dry and oh, nine it, months <laughs> it was it was it was a brutal what cars uh, did, you, did you use one you car uh we did the honda civic si and the reason i chose that car is because it had a factory, and I think it still does, all season tire and an optional summer tire in exactly the same size. So there's no variable uh-huh. difference other than this is an all season tire and this is a, a, a okay. summer tire and the same brand. Both were Michelins. So they were 215, 45, 17s and both Michelins. So the, the thinking was that at least with this car, we've got both of these are factory developed, but they're both in using the same company's tire. So the, the philosophy that that company, the tire mm-hmm. supplier uses is gonna be some kind of uniform thing. And so- Did then, you then add the winter tire yeah, that was from the same company? That was the same size. Yeah, yeah. So they did have a winter tire 
the, the Michelin that in that size. And so, yeah, we did that. And it was a lot of work, but we learned a lot of things. And that, to me, was... What was your big takeaway from that, if you can give us a couple? Because that sounds like an interesting thing for me. Summer tires are not just for summer. They're, I mean, most cases, they're also very good in the wet, uh-huh. and they're great three-season tires, but they're treacherous in the snow. So... But all seasons are kind of like jack of all trades, master of none. Mm-hmm. So it's better to do the switch if you can afford to and if you have a way to do it. Yeah. Um, but uh, you got to time it right. Yeah. My, my, I, I really scared my parents into, you know, they buy high ish performance vehicles considering right. they don't drive in a high, you know, my dad. D- doesn't go fast but he drives a cayenne turbo you know my mom doesn't have a q5 she has an sq5 you know what right. i mean like why i don't know she they like the color whatever but i make them do the t- they live in new york so i make them do the switch right and they're like can we just stop this i'm like no yeah. you must do the switch because like it just it's better well every once in a while you'll hear some freak snowstorm in like atlanta or someplace like that and there'll be like massive pileups yeah and i have to wonder but I, I don't really know if there's just a bunch of people with summer tires that just never really thought about summer snow, tires, and then and they then get this the, freak snowstorm, and they're just totally out to lunch because I got their tires out. are terrible. Like I, I, had, I bought a new Subaru STI in like 07, yeah. and it was, uh, I think it was late October, when I and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy winter tires, but it's still like not really snow season, da, da, da. and I'm at work, and like... I, this was before you had a weather app on your phone and like yeah. freak snowstorm shows up and like drops a foot and they, they sent a bunch of us home from work. So I was driving home in the first foot of snow and thankfully, cause then it, it snowed a few more feet and I was on like the REO seventies on it. And I was like, <laughs> I got all wheel drive. I got the locking diff. And as soon as I tried to get out of the parking lot, I was like, this is going to be a drive. Yeah. And it was like a 12 mile an hour creep. But every time I would just slit, like let the clutch out, the car would just start to crab walk to the right, following the crown of the yeah. road. It was yeah. so, so, so slippery. That happened in my John Cooper works mini too. And I couldn't, I couldn't get up the mildest of inclines. Yeah. I mean, it was well, like five degrees, maybe like not like that's might be a lot, but it was like barely. And it was like, no, nope. it just starts letting go. Yeah. Like, well, like this test we did here was based on something I did when I worked for Hyundai. You know, because at Hyundai, I was developing suspensions, and, and, and part of that is tuning the tire with the tire vendor to, 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 to have the performance characteristics that the suspension tuning guy, which was me, wanted to work with the springs and the shock absorber valving and all that stuff that we did. It was all done at once. All tires are custom tuned to the car they go on, not just one or two Lotuses that claim that. It's pretty much everything. I want to yeah. ask you more about that after you finish your point. Yeah, yeah. So, we would do winter testing and bought at Minnesota and sh- ship up 10 prototypes and 100 tires, and we do just tire testing for a week. And I remember we decided on a Tiburon once to, to try the summer tire. And so we had a garage, and to get to the test area, you went down a little hill, and there was a, a, like an old railroad flat car that was a bridge. And you went over that and then up a hill to and as soon as we tried to drive the Tiburon out of the garage we couldn't even get it over the lip of the concrete <laughs> yeah. to get it 10 feet so we ended up putting it on the all season tires driving it out to the test area and then changing on to the summer tires out in, there out there on the flat ground so we could test them and then getting up to 40 miles an hour which was our test speed you know took almost struggle. the entire length of the available space <laughs> It was it was nuts, and yeah. you see some of the in the results in that thing. If you but that's so overwritten. I, I wrote that long time ago before was I was two thousand nine. Really we saw, I yeah, know, but it still it still applies. Yeah, of course. I'm a, I'm such a snow tire proponent. I love snow tires. Yeah. They're the snow tires on the appropriate vehicle are so much fun, and you have way more grip than you think oh, you're yeah. gonna have. Yeah. it's amazing what they can do with yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I want to ask about the the kind of bespoke tire for yeah. each car. Uh, I guess why do they do that? It seems like there are, you know, cars are sometimes similar enough, and I'm obviously I'm going to be wrong about this, but from my eye, it's like if you have three different sedans that are between, let's say, 3,600 and 3,750 pounds, and they're all like competing in the same segment, and they all they they're not going to feel the same on the road due to suspension, but they're going to feel similar. But let's say that all their tire sizes are the same. Yeah, and then you're going to have a different compound for each one. 
Why is that? It's not necessarily the compound. Okay. Uh, and, you know, there's a couple of things at play. First, each of the manufacturers has different contracts with different suppliers. So Nissan might do Bridgestone and Toyota might do General. Who knows who they've contracted with to put the tire on the car? That's one thing. It's not, it may be a completely different brand. Okay. And then, you know, they're developing the car from the ground up. So everything's uh, up for grabs and there may be a new tire and maybe Toyota or whoever it is wants to have lower rolling resistance to improve their fuel economy. So they specify a certain rolling resistance and they need it to be quieter because they had customer complaints with JD Power last wow. time. So they're trying okay. to improve that. So basically every car that's completely redesigned as they are every five years, they take a fresh look at everything and things change in five years. And so... Uh, yeah, uh, but you're looking at like the belt angle of stuff you can't see, uh, the details of the tread pattern that don't seem to make a difference but might for noise. Um, there's, you know, the number of wires in the bead and the bead stiffness, and there's the wedges that are kind of in the bead behind the, the, the DOT number and things like that. There's just a dozen parts within a tire that you can't see that you can just make a car totally cushy and have terrible steering or you can make it you know feel like it's yeah. on 20s that are rock solid i mean you can go okay. any number of ways with the tire it's just another knob that you have to you know get the car to behave the way you want it to i imagine it's also probably easier to kind of get the suspension where you want it and then decide on a tire that works versus having to choose a tire and then make the car the rest of the car work yeah. around that tire. and this stuff's all iterating in parallel you know yeah. the tire guys are working on on the tire you're working on the springs and the shocks and then there's generations and then there's another round and another round and you you, you kind of like zero in on your final end point yeah. so it's a lot more work behind the scenes than you'd think no, I think it's probably I, I think it's probably a lot. I yeah. just it's, it's, well, I mean, at the end user, it can be annoying. I've had I've been in a situation where I've had a car that was on a spec tire, you know, right. and you get a flat, and they go, "Oh, well, we can't get that tire I for know. like that's a week the, that's or the two biggest weeks." Problem. Like that sucks. And it's know? really bad now because there's not a lot of spares. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that's mm. really helped though, I think, is tire pressure monitoring systems (TPMS). Yeah. You don't see nearly as many road size flats roadside flats as it used to because most of those come from you know tires that are leaking slowly because there's a nail in it and it's losing a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and the guy doesn't notice and then pop you know once it gets down to a certain point the the the, the components inside the tire bending back and yeah. forth like like a, you know when you try to break a paper clip in half I just, and eventually uh, it goes we just had one that was driving us nuts my uh my my uh my mother is the queen Lexus RXs. At one point, she had five of them concurrently. Wow. Gold She's down package. to one. No, no, none of them had the gold package, what? but two were the Jewish racing gold champagne color. Uh -huh. um, but one of them, the fucking TPMS kept coming on. The last one, she, this is recent, kept coming on. Kept co They would go check it. All the, all the tires are fine. Replace the four tires, fine. Turns out it was the, the TPMS in the spare that yeah. was going bad Whoa. and the, even the dealership she went back to the dealership three times they didn't need, they didn't know about the tpms not the spare. they didn't check a bit check it but as it turns out yeah the fifth the fifth sensor in the yeah. spare is optional it's not required by law yeah but if it's there you gotta <laughs> check it and so they didn't uh yeah they didn't yeah, know about it but that, that one bug me out Tires will leak even if you haven't run over anything you know a yeah. pound a month they just do yeah and uh and I know people in cold weather get upset because it'll come on. But, you know, in cold weather, the pressure inside the tire goes down yeah. because that's just physics. And the pressure in the tire is what supports the weight of the car. So even though it went down and it didn't really lose any air, you still have to put some in to bring the tire back because the pressure is what holds the load. You know, when I, you know what I see way too many of around L.A.? Motorcycles with low rear tire pressures. <laughs> 
people don't check their tires on their motorcycles often enough. And the motorcycles don't typically come with TPMS. I mean, at least maybe they might. The brand new ones might, but like. I only ride dirt bikes, so I don't know. They, the ones I've been on pretty much haven't. So like, but I just see people. I'm like, yo, that dude's fucking rear tire is seriously low. And yeah. You know, the, the bike must ride like shit. You would think you'd be able to tell. I can, if my tire's down two or three PSI, I can feel it yeah. like immediately. I'm a, I'm a, even on my little Vespa. Which I ran a little contest today. Guess I've driven. I've had that Vespa a month. I've refreshed that page real quick. Has it gone up yet? It doesn't matter. Game's that over. Choice, by the way. Isn't that nice? Yeah. The three hundred. Yeah, oh, I love it. I ran my Vespa. I've had it one month. That one one month. I had uh-huh. an old kind of crappy small one twenty five before that, and then I upgraded to the three hundred. I've done five hundred miles on that thing in the first month. Wow. Just under five hundred miles. That's a lot for a Vespa. <laughs> I've been to the valley like four or five times. Totally. I rode it to Hollywood, Koreatown. There's that M- the M5 I drove this morning. If you scroll down that white one, uh, more. Uh, this I think I got to get oh, a new mouse, Zach. I think our scrolly wheel's dying over there. <laughs> That's an Alpine white E39 M5. That's clean. one of 139 made in that color. Wow. Alpine white's not my favorite color, but on rarity, you get points. Yeah, that's true. Right? I do prefer colors, but mm-hmm. uh, I do too. But there's a, and there's a couple. Yeah. Of, look at there's the grain yeah, on the steering wheel. That's, that's um, really low. Uh, the uh, they had a couple of reds. They were not the standard Imola reds. There were some other like kind of orangey reds. Mm-hmm. They were super rare that I really liked. What a great car those were. That was like, I mean, it's corny gets to say now but it's like a big miata in that it you could freely feel the yeah. weight transfer as you're driving it around it was fantastic yep um get in the super chat folks if you're with us live we'll get to your questions in just a minute what do you think about uh the what is seemingly going to be an onslaught of ev pickup trucks <laughs> yeah you know I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I have, you know, since I was on the journalist side, that's when EVs came in. I never really did anything with them as an engineer. And, but I drove a Mini E uh, when those first came oh, out. Oh, yeah. In 2008 or whatever as a, it was. as a journalist, or you, or you got, you leased one and drove it? Uh, there was a lease car at, at Inside Line. Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, so I drove it extensively, I think, they had it for six months and i fell in love with the whole idea then that car had insane regenerative braking like more than anything i've ever driven since really 0.25 g (laughs) regen that's really really aggressive regen and (laughs) so it's all lift throttle too so there was no way to turn it on pedal driving it was was like you could honk into a a clover leaf you know just (laughs) really aggressively and then just lift out and the thing is is you're doing like trail braking it's set like, for trail like, like, <laughs> like no one could teach you trail braking like this and then you're picking up the throttle at the apex I mean because it's just one pedal yeah and it was like this is fun yeah you know never mind the fact that I'm not shifting this is just fun on a whole different for a whole different set of reasons yeah and so I was like into it and so yeah I've been following him and we've spent a lot of time driving them I've you know, driven a Model S cross country uh, and had the record for a while uh, before a shorter route opened. Um, I've towed with the Model X. And How did that work for you? That's where the pickup truck question comes in yeah. because the towing with the Model X thing was, it was like, on the one hand, it was brilliant because the torque mm-hmm. and uh, uphill, downhill, level ground all felt the same. Well, that's good. Because I mean, there's, that's like, cool. there's no, like, downshifting, right? There's no, like, strain. Of course, I wasn't towing 10,000 pounds. I was towing 1,600 pounds. Uh-huh. Um, but it felt like it could do anything. And then lift throttle regen to, to a stop with a trailer behind. All of that was brilliant. Um, but the range was, like, really less than half of yeah. what it should have been less than well, half just towing 1600 pounds yeah whoa like 99 miles between one charger and the next that's the next not much was was harrowing like really i gotta go 53 and turn the air conditioning on. oh no that's not good and you know the model x has that nice 
big windshield that's I like love sitting that. under a walk. I do love that. Oh, no, I don't. Not <laughs> not if you have to turn the air conditioning off, but oh, in general, I like it. Oh, I don't know. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't like it. I like to block the, the sun when yeah, I'm driving towards it. And yeah. if you've ever seen the thing they give you as a sunshade, I have. it's so hokey. Yeah, it's, I know. It's but like I think a, I do think it's kind of a, it's a beautiful thing to experience. It's an interesting uh, idea, but like there's a, a particular car in Europe that had something like that, but they had a sliding thing you could pull forward uh-huh. that had uh, sun visors on it but you can't do that you couldn't do that design in a model x because of the 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 doors right the falcon doors there's no room for that well the one i drove had visors like on it but they were yeah, janky they're, as they're, hell they're yeah, like it was, visors, it was comical, which is the yeah. worst part of a miata is the visors <laughs> But they had Miata visors I mean, on a Model X. I, but it seems like we're about to have like five uh, yeah. electric pickups coming. Like, do we re, do pickup people? Are pickup people clamoring for? I don't electric? know. I'm a pickup person, and I know that you know on a strict torque basis they'll be able to tow. Right. But I, my question is, where are you going to go? Because and this is something that maybe they know something I don't know because they know something about what they're doing to their battery packs. And, and and what is coming with the Electrify America Charge Network that I don't know about. But certainly there is uh, a, you know, a question of, you know, what... It, it can, it can what's tow. your time worth? It can tow, great, but I want to go to Zion National Park. Yeah. And can I get there? Yeah. And... Uh, so Someone I just know. did a thing with an e-tron. I read it like a couple days ago. Yeah, Somebody I saw drove that too. a thousand miles or whatever with an e-tron yep. towing. Right. And they said that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase, like you said, the range was disastrous. What the, <laughs> other, the other thing you can see in their pictures that they don't talk about, and this is something I experienced in mine, if you go to uh, my uh, Model X uh, tow test to Flagstaff, I think that'll bring it up. Uh, You can't charge without either bogarting four parking spaces by parking sideways or by disconnecting the trailer and leaving it somewhere and then pulling into the parking spot. No fucking way. So that's the thing about the supercharger network is it's not, there's no pull through, there's one in Mammoth, but they put it in the middle of a park and ride parking lot so you really can't. Get that's in there a real easily. problem, and that's a small trailer. Oh, I love that teardrop trailer. Yeah, I know. I took, is that yours? I took it to the Overland Expo. Is that yours? No, I borrowed it from Off the Grid Rentals. Those are really cool. I slept in it, and Off the Grid Rentals, huh? Yeah, is there like a little be, kitchen or something in the back yeah, of that? It's meant to be towed behind a Jeep, but I towed it behind a Model X. We, Bro. like I said, we took it to the Model, the Overland Expo. I'm heavily about that. But it took me two days to get from LA to Flagstaff. <laughs> I had nope. to stop in Wickenburg. Nope. Yeah. And, Sorry. And that was because the consumption was double. But, you know, when I drove to New York and back in a Model S, our average supercharger stop was 38 minutes. When I towed that trailer to Flagstaff, my average supercharger stop was an hour and 30 minutes. Oh, fuck because, out of here. Because I'd hook it. The, I'd hook the trailer. Well, no, it's not even that. It's I'd arrive empty, but I felt like I had to be 100% full. And batteries charge pretty fast in the first fifty yeah. percent. The last fifty percent takes twice as long as the first fifty percent. There's that's not the exact number, and it depends on the car. But yeah. certainly with Teslas, that was true at the time. Uh, so it was just a matter of a lot of time spent charging, and then not feeling like you could drive very fast when you're towing. So it took a long time. That's if so you're not in a hurry, that's great. But if you're trying to get somewhere, it's not like the the people who drive to the river for the weekend. Yeah, that they want to get there. They want to get there before midnight. Yeah, start skiing on Saturday and Sunday, and leave Sunday afternoon. Get home uh, in the same night. So, I mean, I guess like this is the, not the, that. I'm I, I, look. I like EVs too, but I guess I the real hardcore EV people are saying, "Well, the battery technology will get there." It's like, okay. Well, Until it does, do we need a truck? Well, we don't like, have the trucks yet. So the thing is, is you know, again, I've worked on the development side before, and I know that by the time things come to market, there may be things we don't know about them that come to market at the same time. So I'm willing to have a wait and see attitude, uh, but I I am a little bit you know, trucks are 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 great, and I can see the 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 need for for this or or the desire. I understand it, but. I, I that you know trucks are also used to tow things a lot 
Yeah. And like, and, like when you think of it in that's, a, that becomes the towing part of it is harder for me to, to wrap my head around based on my experience. And it's kind of like, if you're not doing that heavy lifting, whether it's towing or hauling or whatever, like, what are you doing with the truck? <laughs> Well, I mean, a lot of people. There's a lot of, a lot of trucks that drive around. Yeah. I in know. That category. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But like, you know. Well, and if I those are the think, people I who buy think, these, they won't have the problem. Yeah, I guess. But I, yeah. I mean, if you think of the driving experience, like a diesel engine, in my opinion, turbo diesel feels better in a truck than a gas engine. There's just so much torque. It's so much smoother. Like if you can't, you don't notice that trailer. Um, yeah, I think if you, an electric powertrain would deliver an even smoother, it, more refined it ride. Did in the Model X, although but it wasn't it a big comes trailer. with all these issues. No, no, I, I yeah. totally understand. It it, was, it's, it's not. It it's was not really meant for incredible. it. Incredible. I mean, as far as the feeling of of the towing experience, if I was only driving from you know my house in the Palisades to to launch my boat here at the marina. I wouldn't worry about it because the distance wouldn't be enough. There was a problem. Mm-hmm. But if you're trying to, you know, that's true. The get boat, to the Moab boat, the from, boat from the house to the marina is a good good use of it. I yeah, think. there's there's going to be some cases. Yeah, it's not sh- going to be the cement mixer to the job site though, because those people aren't going to buy these trucks. Right. <laughs> and it's not going to be the guy who's rolling coal right now. No, I I think I think the hard part for me is the is the uh, I want to take my airstream. Yeah. Someplace. Yeah. You know, me too. And and, and that's. But, but you know, that's one use case. It's not all of them. And I'm not so much bothered. The range bothers me, but not as much as the fact that b- b- new-ish infrastructure charging stations have already not taken this into account and need to be redesigned. Or yeah. or you've got to do something incredibly inconvenient with your vehicle. Well, or is there, can I get a 100-foot extension cord? No, no extension cords. That's you know, that's where fires start. Yes, or so, I mean, or, yeah. or what? Not you know, obviously but yeah. not. But like, what do you do? Well, there's there's a three part video of me towing a different trailer with a Model X, and it shows you know some of these issues with unhooking the trailer. The fact that it needs to be a three part video in itself is well, a bad sign. <laughs> that was that was more of a uh, creative choice. Right, it probably didn't need to be three parts. But certainly it was fun to do. And I learned a lot from it. So uh, cool. that was the main thing. Let's go to the people. It looks like we've got a few options. What do you got there, Zach? It says, I can't read. Big, 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 big Johnson bikes. That what it says. I'm from Minnesota and I'm visiting LA for a concert in May. I've got a 2015 Mustang GT. I'm looking for a new interesting driving experience through Turo. Bro. What can you afford is the question. Interesting <laughs> driving experience. Turo like literally will separate it into interesting. Like there's like an interesting yeah, card. Drive tab. something old. Drive something Pre-70s old. Pre seventies will always be interesting. Drive something that's a convertible. Drive something that's electric if you've never done that before. Yeah, yeah you could do that. You know? If you've never fucked with an electric, get a model three on Tesla on a Turo for like sixty five dollars a day. It is an eye-opening experience. Yeah, it'd be there's, cool. There's pluses and minuses, but yeah. it certainly is something to try if you've never done For it. For sure. And LA is a good place to try it. Yeah. Because we do have a pretty decent infrastructure and network oh, yeah. and whatever for it. Yeah. And you can also take that Mustang, you know, up one of our canyons, mm-hmm. you know, go up, uh, I like uh, Highway 39 up to Crystal Lake. The That's 39 is favorite. excellent. I don't, I don't use so the long, 39 enough. I should. Yeah, all the way to the top. Is yeah. it open? You it's can, open, well, it right? It gets to the Crystal Lake... Uh, uh, campground, and I think they keep that open all year. Okay, there was a gate closed like a couple of years ago, but then well, it was open. Well, that's to connect to two. That that will never open because there's like a whole section of mountain that came down. No, no, no. There's a gate that goes like a big cul-de-sac-y thing up top. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that's think so. I think. Yeah. Uh, Zach, what does that say? Uh, someone who asks us for buyer advice is back. They don't want an M3. They're comparing an M2 comp or a GT350. They want a daily that always feels special, and they live in New Portia Beach, California. So weather's not an <laughs> issue. Um, they're already buying a 992 C2S for a weekend car. I would say the GT350. That engine feels special all the time. Yeah, and it sounds special all sounds the time. Sounds very good. Yeah, yeah, when you start that thing up cold, you there's, realize there's you have a special that thing. Sound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The M2 is a lovely car, but I do not think it feels special all the time. No, there's a lot of those out there. The other one feels more special, and and that's a really good chassis. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Carl says Carl Vogel says the manual R8s are looking like an interesting option for fifty five to ninety thousand. I agree. There's a couple of them floating around. We talked about the ones that our friend Doug is selling over at Switch Cars. There's one on Bring a Trailer that closed today. 
Is the V10 worth the premium over the V8, and how so? Hmm. Um, they're different. They're just yeah. different. I mean, if you've got the budget to go for the V10, there really isn't a reason not to. Yeah. It's yeah. not, like, bad or worse, even. <laughs> It's just more expensive. Yeah, it is. The V8 is pretty cool. Like it's a like if you're thinking about like you know a a nine nine seven Carrera S versus something else interesting, a V8 R8 is a pretty interesting option. It's very appealing. But yeah. if you've got the extra twenty grand, the V10 is worthwhile. You're pretty close. Only twenty grand away. I think it's twenty grand. It might be twenty five. Wonder which is more I, I'm reliable. Let you, is the four two or the or the V ten? The V tens are pretty stout. The tens are stout. We, they're stout. We felt they're, dealt with. Especially by the time the R eight came around. The early Gallardo V tens are but the by the time the R eight came out, you're talking about like eleven twelves, it's fine. That's L P five sixty engine. You're good. It's the five point two. It's a good engine. And you can get a VF supercharger for thirty thousand dollars, which sounds like a ton of money. But it's 300 extra horsepower. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is good. Uh, Josiah says, what are the pros and cons? Oh, my God. There's four cars in here. Pros and cons. We're going to do this quick. Pros and cons of Miata, BRZ, S2000, and a mid-2000s Camaro. Okay. Pros of a Miata. Handling. Lightweight. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. It's just get in and go. Yeah. Cons. They're fucking small and loud mm -hmm. and cold. <laughs> it's 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 the trunk, but uh, you know I got two suitcases in it uh, on the way up to uh, the new ND has a bigger trunk than you'd think. And the ND is pretty good. Yeah, pros and cons of a BRZ. The engine has negative mid range. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a con for sure. <laughs> that's a con. The it's steering got more room is than great. The Miata. Steering's so great. Steering's good. It's really it's it's a nice car, but yeah, you're gonna wish for more power all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. needs Rotrex supercharger. S2000, really, really good car. Non-adjustable steering wheel is much more annoying than you think it will be. Yeah, and you know, I like torque, and I don't like, I, I know people are going to crucify me, but I just don't like spinning a motor up to 7,000 to make it sing. That's a fair assessment. I, I like torque, I like bottom end, and it doesn't have a lot. Fair. Mm -hmm. I like both. Maybe you prefer an F-body Camaro. Pros and cons. <laughs> 2000 Camaro. <laughs> Mid 2000s. Ooh, I don't know. I've never been a Camaro person, but uh, I, I I have all the Hot Wheels. But <laughs> I mean, I drove one that was like properly set up for a road course, and it was impressive yeah. with square stance and all the stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was as a driving car. I think the steering feel, if I remember, was pretty bad, but the chassis was really good, and the way it, it dynamically was good. But I still don't like them. It doesn't <laughs> inside yeah. outside. Pros it's, doesn't take much to make one go yeah, really fast. fast. Yeah. Cons. I mean, it's made of Legos. Properly and it looks built like of Legos. The inside is made of Legos. Yeah, you, those big, those big cartoon buttons. Remember GM's it's cartoon like a, button face, oh yeah, yeah. where everything looks like dinosaur like, teeth. It's like a senior citizen <laughs> telephone. <laughs> Remember what GM put sixteen big dinosaur teeth on the middle of a Pontiac Grand yeah, Prix yeah, steering yeah. wheel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thojo says. Oh, uh, should I buy a 1999 Infiniti G20T that's in good shape, good option with a decent price, daily driving, and maybe some autocross, and it's even Jewish racing gold? I kind of like the G20T. Yes. Do you remember that one? I don't remember it oh, enough. Man. Pull up a picture. To, 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 uh, let's it was, see a picture. It was the Infiniti US version of the, uh, the Nissan Primera it's not from the one Japan. It's the melted trunk, is it? The melted trunk? I don't know about that. It's no, this thing. No. My friend, oh, yeah, my okay. friend had one of these in high school, and he was not a good driver, and he treated it very badly, and it's it remained working the entire time. It should not have. <laughs> it should not have. Statistics say Devro Bell should have killed this car, and he bought it <laughs> new, and he shouldn't have. You should. If he can't kill it, you probably can't either. They're nice. I, I drove one. I think it was a '94. It, it looked as the boxy design, so I don't know what the differences in suspension design were. But it basically felt like if you combine a Honda Civic Si and an E30, and you tried to sell it for E30 prices, and everyone went ha, <laughs> and then it, it ended up on the used market. It's like two thousand dollars. You know, fairly reliable. I mean, there was it was a it was a very fun car. There's a lot of autocross car. There's a lot of Infinities that lost a lot of value that are better than their used car prices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My friend, uh, my friend Vinny, bought for, I mean, comically little money. A just bought it like a couple weeks ago, like a two thousand and one, uh, two thousand one, two thousand two, the last boxy QX four. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. With the Pathfinder one. Right. And with 130,000 miles, one owner, and it looks really, really nice. And it was like six pennies. And, it, <laughs> and, and, and it's, they're pretty good. Yeah. But he had a Q45T before that. And it's the second gen Q. And there's a lot of first gen Lexus LS bits. Yeah. That are in yeah. It. It's very funny. Uh, Ryukachu, a regular commenter, took my challenge. I have. A, I like to say that you can't unshitbox something. If it left the factory as a shitbox, there's almost no amount of modification you could do to unshitbox something. And I mean, what I mean by that pretty much is build quality. Oh yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. You can make anything go faster, handle better, stop better, ride better. But if it was built like shit, it'll cost you an inordinate amount of money to do that to fix that. Yeah, if, if, if at if all, if you can. Yeah. Like, so, homie took it for a challenge and got a C3 Corvette, 1971. Good luck. Mm, <laughs> so good looking though. Good luck. He wants it to make it good. electric. The problem with well, ele- because you now you hear more rattles. Well, yeah, but a lot of things that could break are gone. You know, that's good one point. of the things. Like the best Fiat 500 is the Fiat 500 the e. e. Yeah, yeah. And it's because it costs that, less than a cell phone. Well, <laughs> that's really what. Well, it's well we had two at home one for 79 bucks a month and the yes, other for 49 yes, so, so yeah wow. yeah no, we had an was, unpaid intern for a while that do. drove one <laughs> yeah and uh yeah but i mean you're getting rid of the motor and the transmission all the stuff that that is not very pleasant about that car and maybe a little bit uh possibly unreliable and now you've got a smooth driving kind of good looking shell it might True. be and it's a good looking car yeah. yeah the best beetle i've ever driven was electric Oh, have you driven one of those Z electrics? I drove the EV West one, yeah, ah. which was excellent. Did you it drive was, the Baja one or the no, street one? The, okay. the, the regular street street one had AC motor and really fast. It was really fast. It was pretty fast. Yeah, I, I mean, want to for a Beetle, those. like it was it was pretty fast. Yeah. I drove their Baja one. And I was like, how fast did it go? And he said, no one is willing to go over ninety. <laughs> and I hit like eighty five, and I understand why. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, they go. Um, They're great. We've got Zach and I have a video coming out tomorrow of a 500 horsepower classic mini Ooh. rear wheel drive. Ooh. It's batshit. It does a 10 Renault second R5. G- anyone? Basically, yeah, and yeah. and but way sketchier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's sketchier than that? When you lift, it's got the square stance on it, yeah. and when you lift, it goes whoa. The hand, the handling is very, very sketchy when your weight transfers forward. Uh, the video is fun though. Uh, Quinn eighteen T says, "Hey Dan, love your suspension breakdowns. Keep oh, it up. thanks." Uh, and Ray says, "Dan, if it was your own money, would you buy a new off-road truck like a Tacoma with a manual or automatic transmission?" Oh, uh, you know, I like shifting myself, but off-road, I I'm not as big. Although right now I've got a JK Jeep downstairs that's got a six-speed manual. Oh, and really? So I'm not opposed to it, but it's a little bit more. I don't want to say more work because that sounds like I'm trying to get out of something but an automatic just feels better off-road i've never had any complaints about an automatic off-road but you know it gets into the gearing and the crawl ratio i mean sometimes a a manual the first gear crawl ratio will be better and you might want that Mm. i know in the jeep i've driven it on some pretty hairy stuff in moab with you know pretty steep hills and it has a rollback feature so when you put in the clutch to make a shift the brakes come on for oh. three seconds so that you don't feel like you got to slip the clutch to keep yourself from rolling oh backwards. see that's good because i stalled on this hill which everyone does and i had to start it up and get it going but it was no big deal so i'm not sure if the tacoma has that feature if it does i, I know they used to have a clutch start cancel where you could start it in gear oh, in oh yeah that situation cool. where yeah. you wouldn't have to put it out and, and so that's kind of neat but i'm not sure of the current yeah, one, good to know. what it's got, but I, I'd I'm be not worried about smoking it. the clutch in situations like that. Yeah. versus I don't worry about a torque converter doing two feet. You know, yeah, and anymore, you know, there's not necessarily a everyday fuel economy advantage to a manual. I right. love manuals. I will no, not I like have a Miata either. any other way. Right, but a Tacoma's not a Miata. I agree. I completely. Agree. I have a. We have a Delica. My wife drives yeah. an old Delica, and people are like. Pfft. You should have got the stick. It's like that experience is not improved by shifting. I thought you were an enthusiast. <laughs> but I, but I fucking like it. steering columns in between my legs. <laughs> yeah. So, you know at least I like that the Tacoma you can get the oh, V6 yeah. with the manual if you want, which isn't the case in some of his competition. So, you know, it's a it's it's a nice choice. It's a nice problem to have. Mm-hmm. Felix says, if you could only own cars from a single brand, what car? what brand would you choose? Who's this for? 
All of us? <laughs> yeah, you. Oh, boy. Oh. From any era? We should add from any era, I think, for ourselves. I'll just say Porsche. Uh, there aren't. They don't make a single car where I'm like, ugh. That's... That's easy to say. It's not easy to afford. True. But I'll go with. I'm going to go we're with in Ford. Land, I think though. we answered this question before. I'm going to go with Ford if we can do all generations because the Gosh. '60s for them were awesome. Daytona Coupe. Ooh. I mean Shelby technically, but I might say Honda, but as a cheat because I could also include a dirt bike or an off-road uh, oh. four-wheeler like mm-hmm. a Talon that mm-hmm. way. Well played. Yeah. Daniel, well played. Well played. Uh, very good. Ali says. Oh. Wait. What? Oh, wait, I think wait, wait. he's saying I have. I have a Mark One Escort with a 300 horsepower Cosworth engine. I currently run oh. Michelin TB15 tarmac race tires. I mostly do back road rallies like the DWA rally. Thoughts on oh 1552 uh, with KO2s? Should I run gravel tire? Oh, oh wait, I think we know this dude. What's up, Ali? I would not put KO2s on a co- on an Escort. I would. No, they're too, They're really loud. The Falcons I have on the Delica are just as grippy. The Falcon, uh, what's the name of them? They've got a name that's like... Wild Peak? Yes, thank you. The Wild Peak. They have the same grip, basically, but aren't nearly as loud. I wouldn't put... I I have KO2s on my 911. It's too fucking loud. Yeah. Here's here's the thing, though, that... I don't know if it's true on this size range, but, you know, on on a Jeep... The KO2s versus the Wild Peaks. I think mm. the Wild Peaks weigh like seven or eight pounds more per Oh, tire. do they really? And oh, there's yeah. There's like a big difference in, in like the weight of the tire itself. Really? Yeah. What tire do I want for my Safari you, 911? Andrew Collins, when he came in here, he did a tire test. I think he took off a pair of KO2s and put on a different off-road tire and saved like six pounds. Yeah. Really? He's a good article. I'll find it on Jalopnik, yeah, I, I, but it was I, about I, that exact thing. That would be a good one. All I know is the difference between the KO2 and the Wild Peaks on a, in a gladiator context. Oh, uh, okay. But I don't know about any All other right, I got, I'm gonna, I got to start looking up some weights. It's not something to, to you, you know, it's worth considering. Yeah, for sure. I don't, My car's Unsprung like 250 horsepower. Yeah. It makes a difference, yeah. Uh, what do you got there, Zach? Uh, this guy just wanted to tell us about a Euro tuning encyclopedia called 1000SEL. Oh, yeah. Dot com. This is a guy who's the, someone's who got all these weird tuned Mercedes from, nice. the, from the 80s. Really this bizarre was, builds. It's a Range Rover with, with six that. wheels. <laughs> And a convertible top. Oh, everyone wow. needs one. All right, that's some interesting stuff. Did you, did that you, Range Rover is excellent, by the way. That is the original six by six. I have all that's the money. A fucking that's what great, that is. Great, great Range Rover. Let's say. Um, Thaddeus showed me our friend who lives in Dubai, Dan, and they have a couple of those one thousand SELs on um, Dubai's version of like Craigslist, which is oh. called Dubizzle. <laughs> Really? Yeah, it's, it's real of too. An, it's of an I era. really didn't believe it for a while. 2012, it, it popped up. I think. Wow. Yeah, uh, and uh, there's like these weird promise cars and very strange Euro tuner stuff that pops up over there, and it doesn't really cost a lot of money because like nobody wants. Everyone only wants the new shiny thing right. over there. There's an in between where of like no man's land where I'm like, yes, yeah. 1,000 SEL Mercedes. <laughs> Give me that CRT TV goodness. <laughs> What else you got, Zach? Uh, David is wants to buy two cars, fifty grand total for the wife and himself. Uh, used market. One needs to be practical, and one needs to be a weekend car. He is thinking a Stinger as the practical and a BRZ for fun. Says no SUVs. I mean, those are both good. Yeah, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. Either. Right I'd rather own the, an ND Miata probably than a BRZ, especially a brand new one if you can afford that. Yeah. You can do the RF, I think. I like the RF. I or, like the soft top. Just throw yeah. it over your your shoulder, and it's down in five seconds. I mean, I like I, I I've always wanted like a a hard top Miata, like a real one, and the B and and the I should like the RF, but I don't know. It just doesn't. RF quite, doesn't really do it. Doesn't for me quite either. do it for me. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Do it. I, I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to disparage it. But I just still like the soft top. If you walked into a Mazda dealer with 50 G's and he was like, I'd like a Miata and a CX-5. They would definitely sell him both of those cars right there for 50 Gs. Uh, Maybe you see, can do CX-5s that? are a little expensive. Are they? Yeah, expensive? They're a little more than that. comparable Maybe a rogues, CX-30. depending. Oh, hmm? all right. Yeah, you have to go to CX-3 maybe. I don't know if you get each one of those for 25, though. That seems a little... If you wanted two... Home. He's talking used market, though, right? Oh, used? He's talking used, which they might have. Yeah, yeah used Stinger and a used BRZ. Sure, There's those are okay. There's some used NDs that are starting to pop up. Yeah. You know? 
off lease 2016. It won't have the new motor, but still. Oh, that's true. But it's okay. It's still all right with the original motor it came with. It's all right, but it's so much better than I know. Isn't it amazing <laughs> that the BRZ has 200 horsepower, but feels like it has less? The, to me, it does than the Miatas. It's just yeah. something about that engine. I don't know what it is. It just never, it never shows up, you know. But it makes a bunch of noise. It feels like it's always like, all right, fine. Yeah, but it, it is a good chassis. It, it is. is. No, I'm a huge yeah. fan yeah. of that's that car the, overall. That's the problem. It's a great chassis. The yeah. steering is amazing. If you want to deal with a soft top or, a, or whatever, you want some space, it's not a bad choice Like, at all. if I find out that you can drive a supercharged BRZ for 30,000 miles without problems, I would. it would be my next car after my E46. Somebody should like tweet it, really it Zach, would. if you've got it. Yeah, do it. I dr- I've driven multiple forced induction ones. I drove a turbo one yeah. that was fine as long as the power was kept at a reasonable level. Mm-hmm. Um, I drove a, the best one was a Rotrex. The Rotrex one was like 285 with the tires, right. with a nice set of shocks, some pads and fluid, and good tires. And this thing was like, oh, fucking Cayman, here I come. You know what I mean? This thing was out. It was right. real quick. And if that is a reliable package over you know a period of years, like. That's money well spent on mm-hmm. one of those. They're, that thing was fast. It was good. So yeah, you doing LS swapping those yet? Oh, yeah. They a, lot, do yet? a lot of FD dudes did. Some guy keeps emailing me every three months. He's like, it's almost done. It's V8 swapped <laughs> uh, BRZ. <laughs> it's very serious. And wow. Just, yeah, nice. Great Canyon car. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, last two. Uh, some guy bought a 2020 Explorer Platinum because he wanted to be a cop. That I added that. Um, <laughs> but he bought it based on Edmund's initial review, the website, not Dan. And he says it has quality problems. He regrets the purchase. Could Ford survive a similar, similarly poor rollout of a Mach-E and the Bronco? Ooh. I mean, depends on how many problems um, there are, really. It, it, are the quality problems uh, known, or is it just, does I, this dude have a bad one? I, You know, I you know? read a few reports that there were some early initial quality problems, but I don't really have any... I can't put a shape to that or yeah. how big it is or whatever, but certainly I liked that vehicle from a dynamic standpoint, from, you know, a basic design standpoint, but just some of the interior materials just didn't quite do it for me, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about outright quality yeah. issues that that I, I can't speak to because, you know, we only ever... In the on the journalist side, see a prepped car yeah, and right. gone through with a fine tooth comb. So we don't really know what's going on at the factory. Yeah, I agree. I our friend uh, our friend is a stunt driver for commercials, and recently told me that she did a commercial for the Explorer ST that she had to drive very aggressively, and her daily driver is a Macan S, mm-hmm. and uh, she said. Better steering feel, better pedal response, better throttle yeah. response than the Macan S from the yeah, Explorer it's, ST. It's a good wow. chassis, uh, but it, it, you know, I, I it, it's a you know, on paper is really yeah. nice, but it, you know, eh, the interior is not my I mean, favorite. But uh, <clears throat> I'd rather be in a Telluride on the inside. Yeah, but I'd rather drive the. It's a good point. Ford, you know, it's kind of like if we could just put those two together, we'd have something really cool. Definitely not this dude's question. Could Ford survive a similarly poor rollout of Mach-E and Bronco? I don't know if the Explorer has been a poor rollout. I think this guy's had an issue, but I'm not entirely sure. I haven't seen stories of swaths of people pissed about their Explorers. Yeah, I I can't. I don't have... I mean, I don't know. Car companies can survive a lot, I think. (laughs) I mean, really, it it would take such like a calamity for both of those models to just to act to like dest- to destroy a Ford of all companies. I mean, yeah. What would have to happen? It would be, it would have to be like, unprecedented. Yeah. 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 I, I'm They'll, excited they have to for melt Bronco. in the rain, like literally. They're always going to be selling F one fifties and F two fifties in True. the background. That'll mm-hmm. keep them going. Mm-hmm. I'm excited for both Mach E and Bronco. I am too. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the Mach-E at the reveal event, which was right next a, door to Elon's hangar, which was great. I thought that was a pretty good, good move. looking car. It looks nice. Yeah. I don't care that they, you know, I don't know which one I'm upset about more. That being a Mustang or the Taycan being a turbo? What do you think? Ooh, uh, I which one think, is more upsetting? I think this being a Mustang is a little more upsetting. I think they had a lot of other 
IP they already had. They had Lightning. They yeah. had Fusion. They had Galaxy. They had a bunch of spacey electric shit they could have used. And I think Mustang is a little cheese ball. Yeah. Uh, Porsche, I'm annoyed at the turbo thing, but they, I already, they already tore that one open by yeah. making all the cars turbo. Well, that's and, it. Yeah. Like and the actual K, turbo every, is only displacement now. <laughs> every Macan's a turbo. Yeah, but they're only the, the turbo is a turbo. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I think I'm more mad at Mustang. Mach E, independent of Mustang. I like doesn't Mach-E. bother me. Yeah. Yeah. In I fact, like I called it on Twitter. I called that it, there would be a variant of Mach and E somehow on tw- on the on no, I like Mach E. Um, I like Maki, but the, I, it could do without the without the horse, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's also like mache, which is kind of funny. <laughs> um, before we get out, oh wait, do we have anything else? Oh, uh, someone says, "What would we want to plan?" Well, to plan understand. Z, what, what is Plan Z? Plan is that- Z is from Spike's podcast. Plan Z is when Spike and Paul Zuckerman and or Jerry Seinfeld split cars. Oh, so they wow. call that the Plan Z, where they buy oh. the GT2 RS and they split it three ways. What and actually, that share? that plan, believe it or not, works out for those guys more mm. often than it does not. We would have to share a car that I don't want to do burnouts in, and that way I will preserve it. Yeah. Because you are nicer to most cars than I am. I'm pretty mechanically so sympathetic. If we shared a nice minivan, oh. that would work. Like a real high, like a high dollar, maybe like a Ram. Like a Sprinter? F- you know, 2,500, you yeah. know, whatever Lariat thing, you know, for a hundred, because what is budget is a hundred grand. Like, then we do that. <laughs> I don't know. I think we'd have, I think it would have to be some kind of like classic. 100K, something that we could like cruise around like an XK120 Jaguar or something like that. Or an E type. That would be hard to break because it wouldn't work a lot. Right. Well, exactly. That's a good idea. Pre broken. <laughs> comes broken. Comes pre broken. <laughs> broken um, in, no pre broken. <laughs> Dan, before we get out of here, you want to plug anything? Um, Other than your social channels? You have any recent stories you want to plug? Any yeah, upcoming did, stories you want to plug? I did. You know, I'm doing that, as somebody else pointed out, my what I used to call suspension walk around, I'm doing as a series of suspension deep dives for Autoblog. And so you, I've done two of those so far, and I've got another one in the can that's being edited that's going to hit tomorrow. What cars have you done? Uh, I did the Forerunner because uh-huh. that's when I had my driveway. So... When Edmonds uh, and I parted ways, uh, I'm moving into the freelance thing is what can I do right now to yeah. get started? <laughs> Good. So I looked at my Forerunner, which happened to have KDSS suspension, which is cool and easy and fun to talk about. And it's a, and it's a current model, it's not a 20, it's an 18. But uh, So I did that and that went over well. And then uh, my buddy at Porsche offered me up a Taycan. Oh, cool. And so I did a Taycan Turbo range test for autoblog oh and that I read got a that. lot of traction yeah, i read that that was good because you got uh really like good numbers yeah like, yeah it's, it's beeps- rated 201 and i have a course that's 104 and a half miles long and i did two laps of that so that's 209.2 miles and i had 78 miles left to go yeah when so zach like, and i drove tycons we both observed that the car would go f- Probably way beyond that EPA thing. Why? Yeah. Where, where, how did this happen? Why? Why did they get screwed so bad with this? And you know, why is it rated so far off of reality? The, I, I don't know all the answers, but I know that the procedure that EPA uses is you do a test, you submit your numbers, and then you take thirty percent off the top, and that's your range number. And why they do that, I'm not sure. Uh, back in the day when the Leaf came out, and you know. 30% meant 30 miles, so they rated it 65 miles instead of 105. Well, 30 miles seems like maybe enough to get home. Yeah. You know, so there's a little bit of a lead foot margin there. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if we're talking about something that's in the two, 300 range, if we need to cut off the same percentage. It seems like we're discounting the, the range too much in actual terms. So I don't really know, but I've found with almost every electric car, except for Tesla, um, I'm able to see the same sort of thing you know with a i've done 334 miles in a bolt i've you know, 334 done, miles in a bolt yeah i've done over 300 in the kona electric i mean and this isn't like total hyper miling it's just not driving like a total yeah. idiot you know and not driving 80 miles an hour on and you freeway. said it, it's you driving s- in la like you we sort always of, do you glossed over it but you said except for tesla yeah we don't i don't see it as 
easy to achieve their numbers and exceed them to this extent. But what I've saw, seen on the Porsche, I've seen other times with other brands. Do you, but so do you think everyone else is just being conservative, whereas Tesla is being super aggressive and no one's really calling them out for it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe I yeah. don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, that, it would that's fit a problem. Everything I, else they do, wouldn't I it? I don't know, but all I know is that. Edmunds had three long-term Teslas, an S, an X, and a three, and that was kind of the same story. And there's not just one, it was 10,000 miles, yeah, 20,000 yeah. miles. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just uh, one one-shot test. Yeah. So, and this was one test. So, you know, if I had that thing for 10,000 miles, would I see it consistently? Probably, but, uh, you know, because I've seen it with other cars. I love Taycan. It was so it's great. It's really nice. It was so yeah. great. I mean, it's crazy expensive, but it was so so awesome it's it's a very nice piece yeah. and you know i t did my my orange county loop for the for the official range test and then i just took it down to borrego springs because there's some bitching roads between here and there borrego springs they're going to charge down there uh friend's house oh, okay so i went down there you know they have an rv and you know it has the, the 1450 motorhome plug that the tesla has well the Tycon has that too so you can plug into an rv jack so if anybody out there has a class a motorhome that they plug in at home oh. with that big cord well they can just buy an electric car and they don't have to do anything cool you know, that's how long same. did it take you to charge up at your buddy's house uh i didn't charge it all the way just because i didn't want to i uh -huh. wanted to try an electrify america charger on the way home so i put two i i, I did it for two hours uh, and then, uh, you know, when I got up the hill, because there's a significant hill out of, out of Borrego Springs, it's really fun and you can't hold back. Uh, when I got up to... to Would you uh, call it a hill climb? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like switchbacks. It'd be great hill climb, actually. Um, but uh, when I got to the Electrify America charger, you know, I had issues and I had to move it around. It took longer than I wanted to. And, you know, it's, it's, it's great <laughs> that, that so they've funny. built out that network, yeah. but it feels like they built it out really quickly i went on the and, Taycan launch which was here in la yeah. and did did my i didn't do the prescribed lap i went straight from the hotel full charge to the canyons beat the shit out of the car and then went straight with like this much juice yeah, left yeah. to the burbank electrify right. america where they had two of the real fast the 350 yep. uh ones one of which was broken i was like oh boy here we go yeah did you find 350s anywhere well there was a 350 but that one was broken so i had to use the 150 which is priced the same which i thought was a ripoff that you get 99 That's cents insulting. per minute not per kilowatt hour, per minute. And one charges more than Get twice as fast here. than the other, and the price is the same. That's one of the things I, I, I need to talk to them about. That's but, ridiculous. But, but you know, we got to remember the supercharger network's been out there for a while. When when we had our first Model S at at, at Edmunds, the uh, supercharger network didn't exist. And then we they built out six of them, and you could get from you know, yeah. Vegas to Lake Tahoe, and that was pretty cool. And then they just kept adding them and adding them. And some of the first ones were 90 kilowatts, and they weren't very fast, and they upgraded them to 120. And there was only four, and then there was eight, and then there was 10, and there was 12. See, so it's this built map out. looks like a lot until you see what the zoom is. It's, it's still a lot. I mean, in the amount of time they've had to build that, they've come a long way in a short time. Now, how many of those, I, 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 I don't, yeah. I, 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 I right. haven't taken a cross-country trip with those. and uh, uh, Someone just did. Yeah. The Audi guys just did, right? They Glucker went, did one, and he said it was kind of slow going in the e-tron. Yeah. yeah. They, they had uh, a couple of issues, but they did better than I thought they would. It's still it's still young. <laughs> yeah. still but a when we still did the Model local. S, you know, we made a run for New York City as soon as the... Uh, you know, Tesla had done it with their own staff, mm. two cars, a van, another van. They had people stationed in hotels so they had fresh drivers. They did all these things. They had, a, you know, be beds in one of the vans, I understand. And uh, they did some time. And then we decided, well, we should do it with ours. And uh, I decided to do a shorter route because one more station had opened up, but there was still a gap between Las Vegas and Beaver, Utah. That's that, a long drive. That is, Beaver, Utah. and it's uphill, yeah. about 5,000 feet of elevation gain with like, you go down 1,500 mm -hmm. and then have to come back up. So it's even more than that. And when I posted my, 
my trip plans on uh, the blog, I got a reply from Tesla saying, don't do it, you won't make it. We're supposed to have this supercharger in Cedar City, Utah, I think it was, that isn't open yet. It hasn't been built. You won't, you know, it's supposed to be there. Yeah. So this corridor isn't viable. I'm like, well, but if I go this way, I'll beat you guys by three hours because you went, they went through like Monument Valley, mm-hmm. this really long route. And I, I figured if we went slow enough on that one leg, we'd do it. And yeah, we went about 55 miles an hour <laughs> for four hours, but we chugged up to Beaver, Utah, and we got there with nine miles left. And then off to the races. So the whole trip yeah. took 67 hours and 21 minutes, which at the time was nine hours faster than Tesla had done it. But then about nine months later, they opened a shorter route that didn't go up through South Dakota and Minnesota. Which oh, you had to go done. that yeah, far we had north? To go way north. Oh, yeah. That was the only corridor that was open at that time. And so when the straight through Kansas one was open, somebody took three or four yeah, hours yeah. off our time, which they should because it's 400 miles shorter and three charges less. Yeah, totally. So, cool. Well, check out that, that range test on Autoblog. That's a good story if you want to get a, a yeah. primer on Dan's work. And I did a suspension walk around with it when I went in. Cool. And you I should do a, tr- a suspension walk around my Safari 911. Ooh, I would like to I mean, do It's that. an interesting thing. Yeah. Interesting rig. Um, and, you were, and what do you have coming up? I've got a Tremor suspension deep oh, dive that's coming up uh, real soon. Are they still building that? Is no, that they just new? started it. CF250... F two fifty Ford F two fifty Brodozer package. You know, it's got thirty fives and it's lifted and it's got trick shocks. Oh and it looks boy! Per- it looks this pretty, doesn't even enter my orbit. It looks pretty bitching. <laughs> Does it? Is it? I diesel? mean, if you're into that, it, well, it can be. Yeah, it can be the th- seven three gas V eight or mm-hmm. the diesel. All right, and uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty interesting. Brodozer. I learned right. a lot. I know they had there was an F one fifty Tremor. Oh yeah, look at that. That's yeah, it's Brodozer. That's an appropriate description. Well, yeah. I mean, not that that, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I mean, that's the kind of the look they're going for, right? Mm-hmm. The lifted, leveled, big tire, black wheels. It's it's a factory turnkey package, and it looks pretty bitchin'. Does it ride like an ox cart when there isn't 500 pounds in the bed? Uh, mm, a little. <laughs> they it's all not do. bad. The diesel has like a high-capacity rear suspension, which I get into in the deep dive, mm. that the gasoline doesn't have. So I'd like to drive one with a gas engine to see how they compare. I just but like anyway. what I like that Ford has Mike Levine doing their stuff because he's like off road every weekend with the trucks. His, oh, he's yeah. a good follow on Twitter as well. Yeah, and he's got a drone that he loves to play. Yeah, with. yeah. I, yeah I is he some. driving and filming himself at the well, same time? There was time? one actually where I was driving and he was sitting next to me playing with a new drone that he was trying to figure it out. It was looking good. Yeah, I like yeah. his drone work. Yeah. Cool, man. Thanks yeah. for coming in the show, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks it. for having me. Uh, follow Dan on uh, Twitter. At, uh, it's Edmonds underscore test. Is that right? Yep. Yes. And then Instagram is uh, suspension tuna. Like yes. the fish. Tuna. I like yeah. I like all use of fish on you know, username. <laughs> any, any use of fish we can do. Thanks for coming down. I appreciate yeah, thanks it. Thanks for having me. I yeah. really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And uh, we, I said yesterday on our show that Brian Deegan was going to come in. We had to postpone that one until after our trip. He's going to come in later. Are we going to do a cruise show tomorrow, Zach? Do we, need, we may or may not. We are going to look at the thing. We have a very we're, Zach and I are going out of town for ten days, so we have uh, we have we have plans to make. The schedule nice. is busy, and uh, we'll we'll let you guys know. But you, we're only airing one episode for the weeks of the seventeenth and the twenty fourth because we are going to be gone as opposed to two episodes a week. So Tuesday episodes only. All right, all right. So we're back Tuesday Thursdays beginning March third again thank you dan thank Thank you you, zach and if you don't hear from me it's because we in tahiti bye guys